Hello. Welcome to Olivet United Methodist Church. We're glad you decided to join us for worship today and hope that your week will be just a little bit better for having spent time with us. My name is Sybil Perrell, and I'm the pastor here and at Forestville Churches in Lylesville, North Carolina. I wanted to have the video service here this week because we had vacation Bible school yesterday. As you can see, I have our backdrop behind me, and we focused on some Bible stories that had to do with faith and salvation. I hope everyone had as good a time as I did. This summer, we'll be singing some favorite hymns of the congregations, and some will come from the Cokesbury Hymnal, while most will come from our United Methodist Hymnal. I hope we sing at least one of your favorites during these summer months. Our opening hymn starts us off with number 732, Come We That Love the Lord, words by Isaac Watts and music by Aaron Williams. We'll sing the first and second verses today. Come we that love the Lord, and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord, and thus around the throne. Let those refuse to sing, who never knew a God, but children of the heavenly King may speak their joys abroad. Let us pray. Almighty God, we are here to sing and praise you this day as we come together to worship. You give us the words to sing and guide us in our praise. Now guide us as we look at your word today. Help us to see and understand, not just in our heads, but also in our hearts, what you would have us to know today. Amen. During the summer months, I like to leave the lectionary and do some kind of a series of sermons on a book or a topic of the Bible. This year, I'll be concentrating on what is called the Minor Prophets, or the Twelve. They're called Minor Prophets, but that doesn't mean that these books are not important. It's just that they're short. The major prophets, like Isaiah and Jeremiah, are pretty thick with more than 50 chapters each, while the minor prophets only have a few chapters. We're beginning our series by looking at the little book of Jonah, chapter 1. I'm reading from the New International Version today, and that's in, available for you in your Bibles if you can find that little tiny book towards the end of the Old Testament. Listen as we begin the story of Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amite. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed to Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us who is, 
who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew and worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had also ta already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, What should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they threw Jonah, took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. May God add a blessing to the reading and understanding of the scriptures today. The book of Jonah is an oddity among the prophetic books. All the other prophets are telling of God's unhappiness with the people of Israel or Judah or both. They're set up in the format of curses and blessings, telling the people what's going to happen to them if they keep up their evil ways on one hand, and then telling them this is what it will be like when they return to God. But the book of Jonah doesn't do that. Jonah is really a story, a parable, like the ones Jesus told, a story with a moral. And I love this story. Jonah is such an interesting character. And whether you really believe he was swallowed by a fish or not, it's still a great story for a good storyteller. We do think Jonah was a real person, not some kind of made-up person just for the story. He's mentioned in 2 Kings as a prophet. It's just part of a verse mentioning his name. And Jesus refers to him when he tells the Pharisees they will only receive the sign of Jonah from him. So that is kind of the lowdown on Jonah as a book of the minor prophets. And that's as a whole. So now let's begin our discussion about this story and what it has to tell us today. The story starts out like so many prophetic books do. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. And we would expect it to say next that Jonah immediately started on his way to Nineveh, or at least that he didn't feel worthy to carry a message from God and argued with God about it for a while before he went God doing what God asked, maybe with some concessions from God, like Aaron helping Moses. That's pretty much what happens with the other prophets. Instead, we're thrown off immediately. Jonah doesn't protest to God that he doesn't want to go. He doesn't talk about his insecurities, about his speaking ability or, or his sciatica kicking up. He simply runs in the opposite direction. Nineveh would have been northeast of Israel in what is now Iraq. It was the capital of the Assyrian Empire several times, so it was the center of culture and trade in the area. It was also totally Gentile. Assyria was also a conquering country, and it caused trouble for Jonah's country of the North Kingdom of Israel for many years with raids of destruction and pilfering. But Jonah was headed to Tarshish, somewhere way west 
of Israel, probably around what is now Spain. So about as far as he could go from where he was supposed to be going. There's some symbolism here that you should take note of. It says Jonah went down to Joppa. He went below deck and lay down. Remember, the people at this time thought God was up there in the heavens. So here's another signal for us that Jonah was going further and further from God, not just from Nineveh. It's hard to get away from God. What's the psalmist say? I'm not quoting here, but something about if I go to the highest heaven, you are there. If I go to the depths of the sea or even to Sheol, you are there. We may try to run and hide from God. We may go as far in the wrong direction as we can, but God is still there, still with you, seeking you to do his will. But like us sometimes, Jonah is at peace with his decision. He goes into a deep sleep, not tossing and turning. He feels he's doing the right thing, or at least he has convinced himself he has. We often convince ourselves that we are justified by not listening to that still small voice of God asking us to go and do things like, I'm too old. I can't speak in front of people. I just can't think of what to say to strangers. I can't do technology. We're too small a church. We don't have that kind of money. Have I stepped on a toe or two? I have sure stepped on mine. The Mediterranean Sea is notorious for storms. And remember, this wasn't some huge ocean liner. This was a small wooden boat. No motor, just sails and oars. They would never get too far from land just in case they needed to make port in a hurry. And this was a humdinger of a storm, more like a hurricane than just a storm. They had no control where they were headed. The only thing they could do was batten down the hatches and pray. Then they started throwing the cargo over to lighten the load. Better to lose their pay than their lives. But it was no good. They were going to be tossed onto the rocks or the waves would swamp the boat and they would sink. How often have we been caught up in events and things out of control? I think about the riot at the Capitol building in January. I'm sure a lot of those people never intended to try and do that. I'm sure there were some who tried to turn around, but by then the momentum dragged them forward. We get caught up in all kinds of problems because we start out going the wrong way. We take the advice of others rather than taking it to God and to help us solve our problem. And suddenly we find ourselves somewhere we never intended to be. I would think drug and alcohol addiction would be like that, thinking you can quit anytime, but finding that the addiction takes over. The crew begins to think this isn't just some storm. This is revenge on someone on board. Jonah finally joins them on deck and they begin to question him. Again, these are Gentiles, pagans, idol worshipers. But they hear that Jonah has run away from his God, who must be very powerful to cause such a storm. And they don't know what to do with him. How do they appease this God they know nothing about? Jonah finally gets a backbone of sorts. He won't jump overboard on his own, but he tells them to throw him over. He is at his lowest he realizes that his life is in God's hands, and if he dies, he dies. But it's not right that he should take all of them with him. We can be at that point, too. We finally reach a point that we know there is no escaping God. 
Lots of ministers come to that point. And we give in to him. We find the courage to simply say, okay, God, I get it. I know I've done a lot of wrong. I realize you know best. Do with me what you will. And we turn our lives over to God. That's what Jonah did that day. So Jonah, who had no intention of witnessing to a bunch of Gentiles in Nineveh, witnesses to a bunch of Gentiles on the ship. And they are converted to God-fearers because of him. Even when we find ourselves running the wrong way, we can still be used for God's purposes. Even when we don't think we can do what we know God wants us to do, we find a way is made for us to succeed. Jonah thought he could run from his responsibilities. He didn't want to be a prophet for his enemies. And he found that you can run, but you can't hide from God. God will find you and continue to move you in the direction he wants without you even realizing it. And it is often so subtle that we don't even realize what we're doing until it's done. Jonah had no intention of bringing these sailors to an understanding of God, but he did and never got to see their faith blossom. That may be true for us today, too. We may find ourselves in a situation and respond in a way that brings others to Christ. God can use us, even us, to further the kingdom, even if we run in the opposite direction. Our hymn is number 496, Sweet Hour of Prayer, words by William Walford and music by William Bradbury. We'll sing the first and second verses today. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my Father's throne make all my wants and wishes known. In seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief and off escapes the tempter snare by thy return, sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, the joys I feel, the bliss I share of those whose anxious spirits burn with strong desires for thy return. With such I hasten to the place where God my Savior shows his face and gladly take my station there and wait for thee, sweet hour of prayer. So let us take that sweet hour of prayer and go to the Lord right now. Creator of all things, we praise you for Vacation Bible School, which is amazing. We praise you for your heart that is within the people here for children. And we praise you for children. It is such a wonderful thing to have them here. We thank you and praise you for people who are healing well. And we praise you for Eugene Freeman and 99 years young today. Oh God. 
Bless us. Bless him and keep him in your care. We thank you for all that you do for us, for so much that we have, so many blessings. We thank you that you draw us to you to hold us close when we are hurting, to guide us when we are lost, and to help us along the way, to give us knowledge and wisdom to be about your work. Help us not to let you down, Lord. We are concerned, Lord, though, for some who are among us, for Danielle and for Cecile, we just ask your blessings, your continued blessings on Louise and Carla and so many who are healing. And we ask you, Lord, to be with those who just can no longer make it to church because of their health. Be with them in a special way. Help them to feel the warmth of your presence and that their heart will be warmed by you knowing that you love them. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus, the healer of us all. Amen. Our final hymn is number 130. God will take care of you. Words by Sevilla Martin and music by Stillman Martin. And we'll sing the first and last verses. Be not dismayed when I be tied. God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide. God will take care of you. God will take care of you. Through every day or all the way, he will take care of you. God will take care of you. No matter what may be the test, God will take care of you. Lean weary one upon his breast. God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. Our announcements for this week. Uh, next week, we'll be looking at chapter three of the book of Jonah. We're skipping chapter two as it is simply Jonah's prayer while in the belly of the fish. I do suggest you read it this week, especially if you're finding that you have been running in the wrong direction. I'll be on retreat this coming Monday and Tuesday and will be unavailable until after 8 p.m. each day. You can leave a message and I'll return your calls and text after that. And there will be no phone tree messages those two days. There will be no backyard Bible study to tomorrow due to my retreat. Scriptures for August 2nd are available today if you'd like to participate. Are you interested in an evening Bible study? I am available Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday evenings to do so, either in person or on Zoom, Google Meet, or as a Facebook group where we interact just by uh, typing. Please let me know if you're interested in this. Furthering our discipleship should be a priority for all Christians. And these days, we have to be inventive on how to do that. Thank you for being with me today. 
And if you have been, if you've realized through this time together that you've been running from God, I'd love to talk with you. Please give me a call at 704-640-6872. And let's talk about how to get you headed in the right direction. And if you'd like to contribute to one of our missions, let us know. You can comment here on youtube.com or on Olivet's Facebook page, or you can send us a letter to P.O. Box 452, Lylesville, North Carolina, 28091. Receive now this blessing. God continues to ask you to trust him with your life. Open your heart and mind to the one who loves you more than life itself. Allow him to guide you on your journey. Go forward in peace and in love. Amen and amen.